The intent of this video is to conduct a walkthrough of the B-29 bomber's crew compartment. The B-29 bomber's crew positions are shown in this image from a 1944 B-29 GenFam manual. Overall, the B-29 central fire control system contributed to the bombers ending World War II with a kill ratio greater than 11.7 to 1. This is a higher kill ratio than the P-51 Mustang's World War II kill ratio. The five B-29 gunner stations are shown in this image. The plane's electrically powered remote controlled turrets are located here. The turrets were armed with either dual or quad mounted Browning AM2 50 caliber machine guns. Each gun was ammo shoot belt fed by 500 rounds of 100% armor piercing incendiary cartridges. B 29s did not adopt tracers in the ammo mix for aiming. Armor piercing incendiary bullets will have silver tips as shown in this B 29 aft lower turret ammo container. Details and parameters of the Browning AN-M2 50 caliber machine guns are shown in this image from a 1944 gunnery training manual. Note that the machine gun's rate of fire was, was up to 850 rounds per minute. This equates to a rate of fire of around 14 rounds per second. The central fire control compartment housed three of the five bomber gunners as shown in this highlighted image. The gunner's compartment is located in the pressurized fuselage section 44 as highlighted in this image from the B-29's 1943 structural repair manual. Fuselage section 44, like the other B-29 airframe structure, is designed as a stress skin semi monocoque construction where the skin is a main load bearing component and the longitudinal stringers and circumferential frames share and distribute the loads into the skin. The side and upper blister gunner cutouts are highlighted here. The body station 646 pressure bulkhead door cutout leads to the B-29's aft bomb bay. This body station 646 bulkhead cutout leads to the forward crew compartment by way of the crew communications tunnel as shown in this view. The body station 834 pressure bulkhead door cutout leads to the non-pressurized compartment. The non-pressurized compartment includes the crew entry door, APU, and the aft lower gun turret. This external view shows the locations of the left blister gunner, central fire control officer, and aft upper turret. This image identifies the B-29 bomber skin gauge, aluminum alloy, and temper. The central fire control compartment's fuselage skin is mostly constructed of an 051 inch thick 24ST clad aluminum sheet as identified in this November 1943 B-29 structural repair manual. This cutaway view shows a section 44 gunner's compartment and the aft section's compartment housing the bomber's radar operator and electronic countermeasures operator. The right gunner's blister is shown here. The left gunner's blister is shown here. The central fire control officer's crown blister is shown here. The central fire control officer sits on a rotating barber chair. Let's take a look at the exterior features of the gunner's compartment. This is a view of the B-29's AN-APQ-13 radar fairing. The radar was used for navigation and overcast bombing. The T-shaped pipe is the plane's radio altimeter sensor. This is one of the two electronic countermeasures blade antennas. The right blister gunner sighting station is shown here. The gunner's transparencies are plexiglass. Inside you can see the barber's chair. Because of early blister plexiglass failures, side gunners were instructed to wear seat belts, as defined in this January 1945 20th Air Force Weekly Newsletter. This image shows a left side gunner dangling out of a failed blister opening. The bomber crew member survived this ordeal. This is the crew entry door of the non-pressurized cavity of Section 44. I'm traveling through Body Station 834 pressure bulkhead circular opening and closing the bulkhead pressure door. This pressurized cavity houses the radar operator and electronic countermeasures operator. The inner mold line quilted blanket is the plane's insulation and is draped along the plane's pressurized interior cavities. The radar operator scope is here. The radar's range is about 100 miles. The electronic countermeasures operator station is here. He is responsible for jamming Japanese radar and communications. We are entering the gunner's cavity past body station 706 bulkhead. This chart shows the B-29 bomber's crew and system's armor locations. The body station 706 bulkhead is armored to protect the three gunners and the fire control components as shown in this view. 
This is the access door to the aft bomb bay. The bomb bay is non-pressurized. This is one of the two bombers cabin pressure regulators. The 35 foot long crew communications tunnel connects the forward crew compartment to the aft crew compartment. Crew members would crawl through the tunnel if needed. This view shows the B-29 bombers pressurized sections. The side blister gunners sit facing aft. The side blister gunners can rotate their pedestal gun sights 60 degrees up, 90 degrees down, 105 degrees forward, and 105 degrees aft. This clip illustrates the azimuth arc visibility of the right blister gunner's pedestal gun sight. The left hand dead man's lever needs to be depressed to complete the gun sight circuit. The push to talk comms microphone thumb switch is on the right hand side. The gunner will dial in the bomber's interceptor's wingspan into the pedestal gun sight with this knob. He will adjust the reticle's brightness using flip down sky filters in bright sun. The gunners were trained to keep both eyes open when tracking and firing on enemy fighters. The gunner will need to continually frame the enemy aircraft's wingspan, and when the interceptor was in within a 900-yard range, the gunner will depress either of the thumb-activated firing buttons. One big advantage the B-29 gunners had over the other World War II flexible mount bomber gunners was that the gun's noise, recoil, and vibration were far field from the gunner station as shown in this B-29 gun harmonization chart. Each crew station comes with a heated clothes rheostat, portable walk-around bottle, on-demand oxygen regulator, oxygen gauge and blinker, and a 1936 Ford Car Company designed ashtray. The bomber would depressurize if hostile action is anticipated. Crew members would wear their oxygen mask if the plane was depressurized at an altitude of over 10,000 feet or at night as shown in this World War II use of oxygen and oxygen equipment document. Oxygen helped with the crew members night vision. The side blister gunner's control box switches are shown in this image. The various gun turrets, amplodynes, and servo amplifiers are mounted on the body station 706 bulkhead. The central fire control computer accounted for a bullet's ballistic solution accounting for drift, deflection, drop due to gravity, atmospheric characteristics, and parallax as shown in this image. This chart shows the primary and secondary turrets each of the gunners can control. The side blister gunners have primary control of the lower aft turret. No other gunner can control this turret. The side blister gunners also have secondary control of the forward lower turret if the bombardier is not using that turret. The side blister gunners also have secondary control of the tail turret if the tail gunner is not using that turret. The side blister gunners can switch turret control amongst themselves by flipping the toggle switch controls located at the base of the barber chair. The lower forward turret has an arc travel of 5 degrees up and 90 degrees down. The lower aft turret has an arc travel of 5 degrees up and 90 degrees down. All turrets adopted fire interrupters to keep from shooting your own airplane. The fire control officer sat in the barber chair and sighted the enemy aircraft using a ring type sighting station. He rotated the barber chair with the ring sight control similar to the pedestal gun sight. The ring sight controls are shown in this image. The top turret gunner switches are shown and defined in this image. The fire control officer had exclusive control of the upper aft turret. No other gunner can control that turret. He had secondary control of the forward upper turret if the bombardier was not using it. This image shows the ring sight's elevation travel. This image shows the various components and integration of the central fire control system. The upper turret's arc travel was 360 degrees in rotation, 90 degrees up, and 5 degrees down. So how effective were the side and upper blister gunners? 20th Bomber Command studied the effectiveness of the B-29's gun system and released a 65-page operations analysis report in February 1945 titled, combat performance of the remote control turrets of the B-29 aircraft. This chart outlines the distribution of 175 Japanese enemy aircraft confirmed destroyed or probably destroyed by the B-29 gunners. The right blister gunner claimed 32 of the 175 aircraft. The left blister gunner claimed 17 of the 175 aircraft. The top blister gunner claimed 44 of the 175 attacks. The top blister gunner claimed the most enemy aircraft. 
Note that Japanese aircraft tended to attack B-29 bombers head-on during daylight missions, as shown in this April 1945 Air Intelligence Summary Chart based on 6,000 attacks. Japanese enemy aircraft tended to attack the B-29 bombers' tail during nighttime attacks based on 231 attacks. The Operations Analysis Report states that front and side attack facing gunners will destroy or probably destroy 15 out of every 100 attacks. That represents about half the combat effectiveness of the tail gunners. The report goes on to state that the top blister gunner is more efficient than the bombardier gunner and that the left gunner's low kills are likely due to infrequent encounters in that direction. No reason was given for the bias in Japanese bomber interceptors' preference to attack the bomber from the right side rather than the left side. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider liking, commenting, or subscribing to the channel, World War II U.S. Bombers.